Canada's unemployment rate dipped below 5% earlier this year, the lowest it's been since a time when bell-bottom pants were all the rage, Walkmans played cassette tapes, and a Trudeau was prime minister, just not the current guy. The situation is changing, however. Recent layoffs at companies like Shopify and hints of a recession have affected the hiring situation for a lot of the big players, yet there's still significant challenges in hiring in many industries and at many small businesses. Today on the Eastern Ontario Business Journal video podcast, we're going to talk to a few experts about ways to address hiring challenges. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Phil Godreau. If you like this show, hit the like button and make sure to subscribe to be notified when new episodes are available. To help us unpack some of the challenges and opportunities in hiring these days, we're welcoming on three guests. We've got Lisa Kelly, Program Manager with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, about the uh, Discover Ability Network, a chamber program intended to help job seekers with a disability find work. We'll also speak to Chris Bloor, CEO of the Tourism Industry Association of Ontario, about the difficulties in recruiting that are being experienced by hospitality and tourism employers and what some are doing to keep their operations afloat. And we'll speak to Bob Peters, Manager of Economic Development for the City of Cornwall, on the proactive ways his city is helping employers find the work they need. First up, we've got Lisa Kelly. Hello, Lisa. Hi. Thank you for inviting me today to join you. Lisa, uh, what can you tell us about the Discover Ability Network? Well, it's been around for a while. It's uh, a network created by business for business. It's part of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. So for those of you that may not know the chamber, that's 60,000 members, 157 local boards of trade or local chambers. And the program was really created to connect employers to labor market because we know that there's labor market shortages out there. So we looked at what's a demographic that could actually provide our employers with um a, you know the the people that they need who are mm -hmm. qualified and we realize that there's an untapped talent market for people with disabilities so the program aims to do that we do that through a free um portal website with tools and resources curated information through a free job matching platform that connects employers to qualified talent and through training to support all those efforts. Okay. Have you seen a change in the types of jobs or uh, types of employers that are seeking help from the Discoverability Network in recent years? I, I wouldn't say so. What, I, I, what I'd say is it's growing. As more and more people recognize this is a great demographic to recruit from. So we've always had a wide variety of industries, of businesses, of different types of organizations. Um, we've seen during, after COVID, during COVID, obviously, there were some changes more for online um, and remote positions. And we've now that the economy's opening up or opened up, we're seeing definitely more frontline, but we still have lots of IT, finance, consulting positions. Mm -hmm. Are there some common questions or, or maybe misconceptions uh, that you hear from employers about hiring persons with disabilities? Yeah, there's a lot. First, I guess, is that people won't be qualified, which is definitely not something that, you know, is borne out by any of the reports or evidence, evidence or, you know, studies that are out there. So that we know that people with disabilities bring skills. It's, you know, people with disabilities comprise 22 percent of the labor market or, you know, of Canadians. Um, they are as qualified in terms of educational, maybe a little less experienced because they haven't been given the opportunities. Um, you know, you can um, find people with both visible and invisible disabilities. So sometimes people forget about the invisible disability component. And they tend to think that, you know, well, accommodations are going to cost a lot. And that is definitely not true. So, you know, in general, 95% of the accommodations required in the workplace are related to family, personal, or religious reasons. So only 5% of accommodation requests are actually given to people with disabilities. And of those people, only 33% of people with disabilities actually ask for an accommodation. So we've got 33% of this demographic who need an accommodation. Most of those accommodations are going to be free or a one-time cost of less than $500. So when you look at the cost of hiring and retaining somebody, 
that's pretty, uh, you know, minor compared to that. We know mm -hmm. that people with disabilities will stay up to seven times as, you know, longer in a job. They'll be as or more productive. They'll have as good of or better attendance and they'll work more safely. So it's a great candidate pool and, you know, really no cost. So again, some of those issues that people think about in terms of productivity, cost, oh, they'll miss more work. It's not borne out by any of the reports or studies that are out there. And we know even anecdotally from the people and the number of businesses that continue to sign up that they find this an amazing candidate pool. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to ask about uh, the, the workplace accommodation issue, especially if you're an employer that hasn't really thought deeply about that particular um, dimension. Um, it's interesting to hear you say, you know, there's not a huge financial cost. No. Um, I'm, I'm thinking to even even a logistical cost, right? You're thinking, oh, maybe there's policies I have to implement or I'm going to have to assign more staff time. But uh, very interesting that uh, not borne out by the, the research. Well, there there will be some changes. So, you know, mm -hmm. as a person with a disability myself, I'm not going to tell you that there won't be changes, right? Mm -hmm. But maybe that's the time to start thinking about, well, why haven't we addressed some of these things? According to the um, AODA, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, we should have implemented many of these changes. And if we haven't, call us and I'll give you some training on what those are. But oftentimes the changes we make in the workplace for one person you know, who has a disability can be rolled out and made everybody more effective. So for instance, you know, think about flexibility and how many businesses, um, you know, said, I can't be flexible. People can't work from home. They just won't do as good of a job. And now after the pandemic, a huge proportion of people are doing, um, you know, work from home or um, a hybrid model. So I think it's looking at some of the inbuilt assumptions and bias that we have but also things like reducing noise or stimuli in the environment works for everybody, not just for people with disabilities. So a lot of times the accommodations that we make that we may not have thought about can actually help everybody become more productive. Very interesting. So if you're an employer, you're hearing this, this sounds good to you. What's your next step uh, so that you can start tapping into the talent pool on yeah, Discoverability reach out Network? To yeah, the OCC. We're here to support you. However we can, we want businesses to thrive and be productive in the province. So this is one of many programs we have. Um, but, you know, contact me, Lisa Kelly at OCC.ca or reach out through our website, discoverability.network. You can contact us through the platform. You can contact me directly. You can contact the OCC and they'll direct you. But, you know, I can only say on behalf of all the businesses that have been adopting this, you know, it's a great program. It's a way to really make use of the talent that's here that's untapped or, you know, underutilized. And it can be a great solution for thinking of new and productive ways of doing things from diverse viewpoints to make your business both more flexible and profitable and productive. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if you're a job seeker with a disability, I'm sure you're uh, eager to get uh, those folks onto the platform as well. I'm, I'm yeah. imagining there's quite a competition right now. Well, it's interesting. So one of the difficulties connecting businesses to people with disabilities is a lot of people with disabilities don't want to self-identify as such because they feel they're going to face bias. You know, maybe they've had bad experiences in the past. So actually, we have a ton of jobs on our platform. And one of our challenges is getting enough of a supply to meet mm -hmm. the demand from employers. So what's unique about our system is when you self-identify, that's kept private and you only share that information if you get a job invitation. So while we ask you to self-identify as a person with a disability so that you can use the platform and when we're doing targeted outreach, the businesses know that you're the person they want to talk to, but that information is under your control about who you want to share it with or not. So again, mm -hmm. on our system, all the employers are inclusive. They're looking actively for people with disabilities. So this is a safe place to disclose, but we further protected it by allowing you to control the disclosure elements. Awesome. I'm sure our next guest knows all about the Discoverability Network. In fact, I'm sure he's leaving no stone unturned in a search for workers for his industry. Chris Bloor is the CEO of the Tourism Industry Association of Ontario. Hi, Chris. Hey, how are you doing? All right, so let's get right into it. Is the problem that workers are leaving the sector and not being replaced? Is it that there's just more work to do, more staffing needs at tourism workplaces because of cleaning and COVID and all that fun stuff? Or is there something else at play? 
Well, that's a great question, Phil. And that's kind of the question that the tourism industry has been grappling with, uh, not just for the last two and a half years, but actually for the last decade. And that's one of the big problems that we're facing right now is that we're still trying to answer those questions that existed before any of us knew where Wuhan was and or, or had heard of COVID-19. We hadn't we were we had vacancy rates of one in 10 across the tourism industry across mm -hmm. Canada before the pandemic. And so obviously uh, when an industry like ours is shut down, uh, restrictions on capacity, you know, we've been so badly affected by the last two and a half years. It's you know, it was an, it, it was not to be unexpected that our workforce would look for uh, regular work to be able to pay their rent, to be able to put food on the table and feed their families. And so we did see a big migration of workers leave our sector over 100,000 in Ontario alone wow. into other sectors, particularly the health sector during the pandemic, uh, when there were specifically uh, large subsidies to go work in health or, or long term care at that point. And we've just not seen those people return in the numbers that we expected to. Now, you mentioned some of the reasons for that. I've talked about some of the historical reasons. Often that's been linked with terms and conditions, pay, ability to go up and down uh, uh, management or, or, or career uh, scale, uh, but also, you know, those added extra impacts that we've had during the pandemic have been you know you've mentioned some of them you know checking people's qr codes checking people's uh, health status in terms of their vaccines you know some people have found it tough to go to a restaurant during the pandemic and when they've been asked a, a million and one questions by their servers they've not reacted well and we've all seen the stories of, of frontline staff not being treated well by some customers in some uh, examples across the province so there's been a perfect storm for the tourism industry but the one that thing that hit us the hardest is you know some Sometimes the province would tell us we were reopening on Friday. There would be a change in the situation and we'd be closed on the Monday. And you just can't run a business as either as an employer or be an employee in that position and have any certainty about whether you're going to have money uh, coming in at the end of the week or the end of the month. So, you know, we've lost a lot of people. We're trying to win them back now. The industry is looking internally about what we can do and working with government and business and, and the sector to try and explain to people and attract a new set of people who perhaps never looked at the towards the ministry as a career to come and take a second look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure it's difficult too if you're thinking about booking a restaurant and uh, oh gee, am I going to actually be able to go next week or, or whatever. So uh, at, at least we're past some of those lockdowns and other restrictions. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, what are some of the innovative ways companies are addressing the shortage of workers? Well, there are some really great things happening across the province. Some of our employers are helping with relocation costs to attract people to go to other parts of the province. Some of our employers are putting really strict uh, and clear, transparent HR practices in place to make sure that they're protecting the health, uh, whether that's the uh, physical or mental health uh, of our future employees. Some people are, e some employees are even getting into the business of providing housing. Uh, mm -hmm. or access to housing for some of our employees in some of our rural areas and tourism hotspots. So our businesses aren't just moving on terms and paying conditions. They're moving on those other factors that are hindering people from entering our workforce. And, you know, we kicked off this interview talking about your uh, previous interview and, and the discovery uh, ability network. And, you know, we're trying to uh, really try and move to get people who've never considered working in the industry, whether that's people who are older, people with disabilities, young people who've never considered working in our industry to really have a second look. And I think that's key for us moving forward. And on top of that, we are also looking to work with the federal government to change rules on permanent permanent residency, particularly for those international students that have come to study uh, in Ontario and Canada. They want to work in the tourism and hospitality industry, but they have to go through so many hoops to be able to stay here and work within our industry. I'm pleased to say in the last few weeks and months, we've seen more movement uh, on, on tinkering with our immigration system to allow those students to stay. And that's really pleasing for us as an industry. Absolutely. So uh, if you're an employer and you're stuck in this situation, you're having difficulty filling jobs, um, what are some of the resources available to you? So that's, again, another great question, Phil, because there is so much out there at the moment, whether that's going to the Tile website, whether that's going to the CFIB website, whether that's going to the Ontario Restaurant and Hotel Motel Association uh, website. There are some great programs and great resources for even the smallest of businesses that are available right now. And that's one thing that we're really trying to concentrate on as associations and sector representatives as we try and take on this crisis. We're trying to make sure that every business has access to be able to put together a good 
uh, job advertisement, how to interview people, what practices can they put in place on the ground to make their future employees feel safe and protected. So there's lots of resources right now, including subsidies. Uh, you know, particularly I just mentioned Orma, they're running a very good program right now uh, to, to attract people into the industry, offering up to 50% wage subsidies uh, uh, for, for new entrants to the industry. We're working with our Indigenous Tourism Ontario colleagues and, and education providers to encourage Indigenous uh, uh, future employees into the tourism industry right now. So, you know, I would say visit the Tayo website. We've got all our links to our partners' work, our partner programs right now, and all the things that we're doing with MLTSD and the provincial side, but also the things that Tourism HR Canada are doing federally mm -hmm. just to try and encourage people to get back into the industry. There's both subsidies available right now, and I really want businesses to take advantage of them, but there's also training templates on how to uh, to support HR practices, all the things that we're putting so much effort into right now to make uh, our, our industry as attractive as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, I can think of uh, some folks who maybe don't work in the industry or they're not business owners thinking, oh, worker shortages. I mean, so a restaurant owner doesn't earn as much money. So mm -hmm. that cruise ship operator has to cancel a few runs. What's the big deal? But there are some broader economic considerations. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. And listen, um, you know, I, I, I totally understand where people are coming from. But, you know, we have just had two and a half years of almost lockdown and heavy restrictions for our industry. And so the ability to reopen, the ability to get people back through the doors is such an important thing for our industry. I remember, you know, just a few months ago talking to businesses that had experienced 90 percent revenue losses during this period. But their fixed costs has actually gone up in northern Ontario right now because of restrictions on uh, unvaccinated Americans coming into the province and into Canada, they're still at remarkably high revenue declines, up to 75, 80%, because only one in two people are actually coming across that American-Canadian border uh, on the land border that they were doing before. So, you know, what I would say to people is, is that it's really important that we get people back into our businesses so that when people come to visit us, that restaurant's open seven days a week, not just five days a week, so that that restaurant can hire more Ontarians to get jobs, maybe their first job, maybe a new career choice. You know, as a, as a country, we're trying to make uh, Ontario and Canada the most attractive to uh uh, international tourists as possible and we know for every tourist that we bring in that's extra money to the economy that's extra wages that's extra benefits we know we can build prosperity through the visitor economy so it's super important as we move forward that we create that conveyor belt of people into our industry but also we have a responsibility as an industry too and that is to explain what job opportunities there are in the visitor economy it's not just front of house there are some exciting opportunities across lots of different sectors and it's also our opportunity to make sure that we treat those people and keep those people within our industry moving forward but you know, in Ontario alone, the tourism and hospitality industry is $36 billion. We provide 5% of the money that goes back into the treasury. So if you want to invest in teachers and you want classroom sizes to be smaller, or you want more improved public services, then we have to maximize our ability to maximize the tourism industry's economic and tax receipts. And we've left a lot of opportunities on the table before the pandemic. We're thinking now, how can we rebuild and build on those previous missed opportunities that we can build going forward. And I'm really excited the way in that we're reimagining the tourism industry and visitor economy. And that money that comes into this province and come in federally, federally will pay for the public services that maybe those people who might say those things feel really care about. So uh, mm -hmm. I think it's win-win for everybody. Yeah, you make a, a compelling case. There's the the economic argument. There's There's keeping people hired. There's bringing more money into the treasury. So we all recognize there's an issue here. Uh, and there's lots of programs, and there's lots of subsidies. Bottom line, how do you see this issue being resolved? I think it's going to be a long term uh, 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 you know effort from the industry for we have to put the amount of effort that we've put in over the last 12 months long term. We have to build those links with the uh, provincial government and federal government to really create workforce strategies that will answer the problems that we and, and challenges that we'll have over the next 10 years rather than just the immediate 12, 18 months. And I'm confident that by the next 18, 24 months, we'll get back uh, to the staffing levels that we need, but also have the staff and the future staff that we need to build on those opportunities that we've been talking about. But no, listen, it's the number one challenge facing the tourism industry right now but i've never quite seen the industry come together as it is right now to answer this and so that's what encourages me that's what keeps me 
uh, positive and optimistic that we'll actually meet these challenges. And, you know, I'm really grateful for the support that we have on the provincial level for Minister uh, uh, Monty McNaughton, who is the, the Labour Minister in Ontario. He really understands that we can offer people opportunities, good paying jobs and build an economy that works for everybody. Awesome. Municipalities have an important role to play in helping businesses attract workers, especially in the post-COVID work-from-home environment some of us get to live in. Municipalities can highlight available opportunities to job seekers, showcase what a great place to live their city is, and invest their efforts to address their local employers' pain points. Bob Peters from the City of Cornwall joins us now. Hi, Bob. Hey, Phil. How are you? I'm um, great. The city of Cornwall has had a bit of a different mindset in how you attract workers and help your employers keep functioning. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's been several years now that we've realized that we have a role to play and that we can help our employers uh, not only attract workers, but just get the word out about the opportunities that they can provide, um, you know, in terms of not only the job itself, but the work culture and the environment and the community. And so since for, for several years now, we've maintained a job board on choosecornwall.ca and we've been actively involved in attending job fairs and career fairs to promote the, the variety of employment opportunities that exist in Cornwall. So how is your focus shifting as we enter this era of higher costs and possible recession? It's a good question. I, I think the, the focus is, is even more our message is welcome by job seekers because Cornwall historically has offered a very affordable living and a uh, place to live and a lifestyle and, and a, a really good quality of life work balance. And uh, we still maintain that competitive position compared to major metropolitan cities where it's becoming extremely expensive to live and living may not be at the, the type of lifestyle that, that the, the individual or families want. And Cornwall very much is a family oriented and a, a lower cost uh, community and, and a great alternative choice for people. So um, as we move into recessionary pressures, I think, you know, that message just becomes more and more welcome. Uh, your, your dollar simply goes further in Cornwall than it would in a, in a large urban center. And then I think, you know, the other flip side of that question is, are the opportunities slowing down for our perspective? And from what we've seen from our major employers is job opportunities are not slowing down as you might expect in a recessionary period. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the employers are still actively looking to fill hundreds of positions. Mm -hmm. So what messages have you found really resonate with those job seekers? Uh, you, you talked a little bit about the family oriented city, the, the cost of living. Um, but uh, you're talking about, in some cases, moving uh, around the world for your international right. job seekers, or you're talking about uh, at least across the province. So um, what's uh, what's the most attractive piece, you think? We, we always like to, to joke the fact that we don't have a rush hour. We don't have tra tra traffic. Mm -hmm. um, most of our employers offer free parking, so you never have to worry about parking. You can own a house in Cornwall and have a mortgage that that really you're not living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and the fact that you can leave work and be on the first tee or down at the marina within minutes uh, mm -hmm. of leaving work is so that it all combines into that that message of lifestyle. And it's it's something that was really hard to qual quantify when, you know, 10, 20 years ago when we were marketing, East Ontario was marketing itself as an alternative to large urban centers. Uh, but now you can quantify it and you can point to very specific things that that will make a difference in people's lives. And at the same time, Cornwall is still a city. It's, so it's a full urban city with full urban amenities. We have transit, we have shops, we have restaurants, we have, you know, the, the type of urban experiences you would expect in a major urban center, but without the cost. And for young people in Toronto and in Montreal that we've been talking to, um, that message of being able to actually get a head start on their dreams and be able to move towards home ownership, that, that message is really resonating. Mm -hmm. Canadian dream isn't dead. It's just moved up the St. Lawrence. That's Something correct. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> what feedback do you get from employers uh, about the Choose Cornwall job board? And, and do they feel like they're just increasing the competition and cost for each other uh, when they're all kind of fishing from the same lake? Or do they embrace that whole of Cornwall type of approach? 
Yeah, it's you know it's a good question. So the feedback uh, we've had from our our employers have been extremely positive. It has been a learning experience for everybody in terms of uh, how does that fit in with the whole you know cornucopia of of job sites that are out there. And what we like to tell the job seekers is that the Choose Cornwall Job Board captures about eighty to ninety percent of the jobs that are available at any given time. Whereas a, a site like uh, some of the major job uh, listing sites maybe only capture 25%. And uh, if you're moving to a different community, if you don't know the major employers, really the best spot to look is on each major employer website. What the, what the Choose Cornell website does is it, it compiles all of those jobs and puts it together in one easy uh, to accessible site that's searchable and, and organizable by, by the job seeker. And, and for the employer's perspective, they're just happy for the opportunity to put their opportunity, their jobs in front of those job seekers. And so they're very, very positive, working very closely with us. And, and we're also bringing them into our activities as we extend out and promote the site by attending various university career fairs and job fairs. So um, everything always boils down to that connection between the employer and the job seeker. And the Choose Cornwall Job Board really facilitates that process. And we're getting great comments back from not only employers, but from job seekers as well. Awesome. Bob Peters from the City of Cornwall, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Our thanks to Lisa Kelly from the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, Chris Bloor from the TIAO, Tourism Industry Association of Ontario, and Bob Peters, of course, from the City of Cornwall for their insights today on this important topic. For important business news affecting Eastern Ontario, always stay tuned to obj.ca. Before we wrap today, a quick note to remind you about the Eastern Ontario Business Journal's Fastest Growing Companies 2022, presented by MNP. The EOBJ is looking for the region's fastest growing private companies, which can demonstrate significant year over year revenue growth over a three year period. This is a unique opportunity to be recognized for significant, sustainable and profitable growth. Visit obj.ca, submit your nomination by August 19. Good luck. The Eastern Ontario Business Journal podcast is made possible by these sponsors. The City of Cornwall. The County of Leeds Grenville. County of Renfrew. Join us again in September when we discuss housing. By some estimates, Ontario needs 3.5 million new homes by 2030 to achieve affordability. That's according to the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Getting there is going to require some unique and innovative approaches. I'll speak to some entrepreneurs and innovators who are leading the way. Until next time, I'm Phil Godreau. Thanks for joining us.